269 billion US dollars. That's the amount Russia earned from oil and gas deals in 2021. Then Russia invaded Ukraine, and Western countries launched an economic campaign to isolate Russia, depriving the country of its financial resources. Over in Russia, the discussions are getting heated. Plenty of people predict a looming budget deficit and some rough times ahead. But a year goes by and turns out that in 2022, Russia got $384 billion, setting up a new record in modern history. So, what's the deal? How's Russia dodging the EU's economic sanctions? Who is still stepping up to buy Russian oil? What kinds of surveillance tricks in shipping help with that? And when will Russia finally collapse? The Drushba oil pipeline is one of the largest oil pipeline networks in the world, stretching out within 9,000 kilometers, hooking up 10 countries. The pipeline starts at Almetyovsk in Tatarstan, going past the Kazakh border until it hits the Bryansk region, more specifically Yuncha. From the main pipeline here, the Baltic Pipeline System 2 breaks away, heading straight to the seaport of UST Luga in the Baltic Sea, staying on the Russian land all the way. And right there is the spot where the pipeline does a little fork in the road, splitting into two directions, both flowing through Belarus. One of them goes to the Baltic countries, and the other keeps moving to Central Europe, through the Belarusian Mozir. And here it is once again split, with the northern branch heading to Poland and Germany, while the southern route makes its way to Hungary, Slovakia and the Czech Republic, all through Ukraine. So, as you can see, Russian oil has the EU in its grip, and we're just talking about the pipeline. There's also oil barrels travelling to Europe by sea. Remember this titbit, as it's gonna matter later in this story. But for now, let's check how much the European Union leans on Russian oil. In short, too much. Let's start with the broader picture of the EU-Russia trade ties. You got one line illustrating the imports and another for the exports. These two indicators represent the balance of trade. A positive balance of trade means the value of exports is higher than of imports, while a negative one means the opposite. And that is exactly what we see here. The EU buys a whole lot more from Russia than they sell. Thus, in these trade relations, the EU owns a negative balance of trade. Now, you've probably already got the idea what goods are imported or exported. The EU sells industrial goods, chemicals, equipment, transportation and some booze. Russia, well, still stays true to its roots, exporting the Earth's treasures. Check out these huge red columns, they reach up to 50 billion euros per quarter. That's the sale of Russian raw materials and energy resources. It's pretty wild how the sale of what the Earth's crust can provide is like a golden ticket. No matter how hard people try to come up with high-tech and unique production schemes, selling hydrocarbons and metals still brings in more bucks. Ultimately, the entire European Union was 29% dependent on Russian oil. While Russia took the biggest share, no other country could even come close with their 8%. By the way, if you're curious about which countries were most reliant on Russia, here's the list from top to bottom. For instance, Slovakia was getting 70% of all oil from Russia. These figures were fairly steady every month. Then the war started. Sanctions, attempts to isolate Russia and reduce its income for special operations and all that stuff. Lithuania is the first country whose purchases have plummeted, followed by Finland. Other countries are joining in. 
Out of the top 10 countries, only three still engage in purchases in Russia, Slovakia, Hungary and the Czech Republic. Now what? A split in the EU, huh? Well, not really. The way things work here is pretty practical and straightforward. Sanctions prohibited the import of Russian oil brought by sea. As I mentioned earlier, it is crucial to make a clear distinction between oil flowing through pipelines and oil shipped in barrels by sea. If you take a peek at the map, you'll notice that these three landlocked countries clearly don't have ports to handle oil in barrels. And if you dig into the EU's most recent oil deals, you'll see that Russia's share is now about 8 billion euros out of a grand total of 30 billion euros per quarter. Other players like the USA, Norway, Saudi Arabia and Kazakhstan saw their chance and stepped in to fill the gap left by Russia's shrinking supply. The share of Russian oil supplies to the EU dropped from 29% to 2%. But even with this info in mind, Russia still managed to pull off a new record for the revenue generated from oil and gas in 2022. Sure, this also includes natural gas. Still, you can check the reports from all over the globe to support the claim that Russia did not just sit back and watch oil production drop, but in fact even saw an increase in its crude oil output. So. Who should Russia be thanking for this record-breaking year? Officially, the oil restrictions hit the scene on December the 5th, 2022, while the others for petroleum took effect on February the 5th, 2023. And once again, the embargo impacted only sea transport, no restrictions were imposed on the pipelines. That's where things started to get a little tangled. The European Union's big dream is to phase out Russian oil entirely, but the uses for this black gold vary greatly, ranging from fuel to such chemicals as ethylene vinyl acetate, styrene, polyethylene, polyvinyl chloride, and other polysyllabic gibberish, all produced from oil and all closely intertwined with our everyday lives. The EU nations there had the opportunity to make deals with other sea-based oil suppliers, switched away from Russian oil, while the others remained dependent on the Russian pipelines. What's more, the Czech Republic and Hungary even increased the volume of their oil supplies from Russia. To put it simply, the northern branch of the Druzhba pipeline has nearly stopped, and the southern route mainly serves these three countries' interests. Now, here is a nugget of info to spice up the story. The Russian oil pipeline still passes through Ukraine. War is war, and money is money. Everyone is in here to replenish their budgets. The EU began reducing oil shipments by sea even before the embargo. It was around 2 million barrels per day before the war, and then it dropped to 1 million due to the self-imposed sanctions. After the embargo, the figure decreased to a half a million barrels per day. But Russia's oil production remained unaffected, which means that the European market was somehow replaced. It really took a turn. The same amounts of oil that used to go to the EU are now heading to India and China. The volume was half a million barrels a day before the war, then it went up to two million and slightly more. Once again, a prime example of how when opportunities knock, someone's always going to answer the door and fill in the gaps. And just to jog your memory, the Eastern Siberia Pacific Ocean oil pipeline still runs from Russia to China, annually delivering 30 million tons, with another 10 million making its way through Kazakhstan, plus exports by sea. So China can receive 40 million tons just from the pipelines alone, all while complying with the sanctions. But as China follows sanctions only half-heartedly, Russia steps up as a new leader in the oil supply to China. In January-June, Russian oil accounted for a 20% share of all Chinese imports. But Saudi Arabia is still right on Russia's tail. 
One of our upcoming episodes is going to dive deep into China's gas supply schemes. China gets it, they know how diversification works when it comes to gas and oil imports, and would not want to put all the eggs in one basket. So, right now, China is working with around 15 different suppliers. And you best believe this situation can change real quick. In the first half of 2023, Russia became the leading oil supplier. While in 2022, Saudi Arabia held this top position throughout the year, but there are no absolute leaders here, but only two equal players. It's also worth noting that though Russia and Saudi Arabia sold the same amount of oil, Russian oil was priced 10% lower. China is wise enough to prioritize energy security while paying more. Now, India, and no offense, isn't too concerned about what's happening on the other side of the world. They've got enough on their plate. Education is a disaster, many villages couldn't even read or write when the internet first came around, and that led to the unfortunate loss of hundreds of innocent lives. We covered this in one of our videos. In Duhul district, every third person doesn't know how to read or write. And I'm not even talking about extraordinary things like critical thinking. But this doesn't prevent people from enjoying the fruits of technological progress. They bought smartphones and installed Instagram and WhatsApp. In addition, India's population is booming with about one and a half billion people, and they need to be somehow provided for. God has given India a lot of things, but no resources, limited amount of oil and limited amounts of gas. So, when Europe had its major crisis on February the 24th, India saw a golden opportunity. The point here is that Russian Ural's crude oil used to come with a discount compared to Russian branded Brent, which is the benchmark oil. The discount was only a few bucks. In 2022, everything changed, and now we're talking about the massive price difference. It's no longer a few bucks, but tens of dollars, and that's a big deal. India sees the chance to purchase oil at $70 instead of the usual 100 and they're like, Discounted prices have a very huge impact on our economy in terms of helping the Indian economy grow, the price being very reasonable that we get from Russia. Now, here's another interesting twist. By importing from Russia, India also has helped the global economy in the sense that we freed up some oil on the Gulf for other countries to source, particularly Europe, so it was kind of a win-win situation. And we've got to confront an uncomfortable truth. On one hand, the EU banned all crude oil and petroleum products from Russia, but once this oil is rebranded by an Indian refinery, it's suddenly okay again, and all good to go. So, before the war, India was shipping roughly a million barrels a day to the EU, but after the war, in the blink of an eye, this number increased by sevenfold to 7.4 million barrels. To be real, this is not too much to cause a major uproar, but as they say, there's always a bitter aftertaste to consider. And then it was Josep Borrell who suddenly spoke some common sense and was like, what kind of nonsense is that? We slapped sanctions on Russia for a reason, didn't we? And for what? Anyway, while one part of the world is witnessing death and destruction, the other side is getting a golden opportunity to obtain resources faster and cheaper. This is the scenario that unfolded after February the 24th, with Russian oil flying off the shelves, going from half a million to two million barrels per day. And that's not even the whole story yet. You've probably heard about the oil price cap, but let's take a moment to remind ourselves what kind of price caps are out there. In a nutshell, we can name a few types. The price cap for crude oil shipped by sea, plus a couple more for those refined petroleum products. As Western politicians might put it, the oil price cap is like trying to have your cake and eat it too. It's a way to keep getting the vital oil resource while putting the brakes on funding for the war in Ukraine. 
The motive and the method are crystal clear. If a barrel of Russian oil hits over $60, there's no touching it with a 10-foot pole, but here's the kicker. The price of the barrel itself and the transport cost are considered separately. It was at this moment that he knew. He fucked up. You sell a barrel for $50, but you bump up the transport costs, let's say, to $15 instead of $5. That's how you conform to the pricing policy and still have buyers paying less than they would for the benchmark Brent oil. Everyone is satisfied now. Now, that's just an example, and the price can include a bunch of variables, leaving room for some price manipulation. The ineffectiveness of the price cap was not immediately obvious, not for the first six months. When the price cap came into play, the price of Brent began to drop, and then Urals followed suit, with both staying below $60 per barrel, thanks to the discounts, not the price cap itself. This went on for a solid five months. In theory, I mean, just theory, if the price cap did its job, then in case of oil price fluctuations, the Russian oil price should have mirrored those changes, just like in the analysis suggested by Russia's Economic Development Institution. But in response to oil price growth, the Russian price should have stayed at $60, never exceeding that threshold. But in July, OPEC Plus agreed to cut oil production, sending prices soaring. And the Russian Ministry of Finance reported that in July, the price per barrel was $64, which clearly shows the price cap isn't working. And then the price went way over the top. In August, the price hit $74, and by September, it climbed to $83. And in this case, we've got some data to work with. But there's also shadow fleets lurking in the background. So, do you agree that it is right to adopt best international practices? Well, Russia learned a thing or two from the experiences of Iran and Venezuela, who've had a history of long-banned oil. There's this common practice where aging oil tankers get snatched up, repainted, given new names and get shipped to secret buyers, with their transponders turned off. Ever since the European Union started discussing logistic sanctions against Russia, those used tankers have been flying off the shelves. In the past year alone, around 200 tankers changed hands. That's a 55% increase compared to 2021. Here's a curious coincidence. Most of these are the Aframax and Suez Max tanker types, with a maximum capacity of 1 million barrels each, and they're the only ones small enough to dock at Russian ports. Demand for Aframaxes has been so strong that a few recently sold for $35 million, the average price China paid last year to buy much larger vessels, which can carry up to 2 million barrels. And this is where it gets real, James Bond. Sometimes these ships do not just switch off transponders that let you know their whereabouts. Nope, they go with spoofing, sending out fake locations. Now, here comes a cool story with a star of the show, the tanker called Cathay Phoenix. In February 2023, this oil tanker sent out a signal saying it was sailing west of Japan, going in an odd direction. All day long, the ship kept juggling its location updates. The satellite images didn't help clear things up, showing nothing out there. Turns out the ship was actually 250 miles north, chilling at the Russian port of Gozmina, meaning it was probably making trips to China, likely breaking sanctions. Interesting tidbit, back in the day, Europeans used to call China Cathay, and now this Chinese phoenix got busted by the times. Why go through all this fuss with these fisting, fishing, spoofing tricks if neither China nor Russia cares about the sanctions? It's not about that. It's all about insurance. If a ship does not have insurance, most ports around the world won't let it in. And most of the big insurers are in the West. So they're not going to insure shady ships carrying dubious oil. 
After the investigation went public, they had to adjust the insurance coverage for the Cathay Phoenix from January 2024 to June 2023. But keep in mind, we might be seeing some survivorship bias here. How many similar ships slipped under the radar of reporters and regulators? Here's the lowdown on the oil situation. So, on one hand, Western countries have publicly abandoned Russian oil and petroleum products. But in reality, there's a whole lot more to the story. There are three landlocked EU countries along the southern branch of the Druzba oil pipeline, and they are kind of stuck having to keep buying Russian oil. But even if they did have sea access, there are these so-called laundering countries where Russian oil gets processed and then shipped to the European Union. Here's a vivid picture of a wild mix of oil from China, India and Turkey, and now Russian oil ends up in the EU as some gasoline. Now, let's recap the oil price cap. It is obviously ineffective. You cannot fully curb Russian oil because this is going to result in oil prices rising, leading to wild inflation due to the supply drop. In reality, nobody wants that. It was okay to talk about price caps when Ural's oil was cheaper than the cap, but now, well, it's just not the right time to bring it up, you know? Here's another not-so-favorable fact in civilized society. Taking a look at the increase in oil exports from Kazakhstan via the Druzba pipeline. It is unlikely that Russia won't be profiting from this. They will either get paid for transit, or the profits will be coming from the blend of Russian and Kazakh oil, if it is not all Russian, of course. But, well, yeah, it's okay, go on, putting all the blame on Russians. Plus, let the market decide, right? There are shadow fleets with all their spoofing systems. When you look at these half-baked methods for cutting Russia's funding and see the EU still throwing down billions for Russian oil, it feels kind of hypocritical to slap sanctions on Russian people. The sanctions that ban entry to the Baltic countries with the Russian license plates are especially nonsensical. Well, you must be on Putin's payroll, pushing that propaganda. No, it's just infuriating when the EU discriminates against people based on passports, making life difficult for ordinary Russians while they themselves continue to buy oil worth millions of bucks. Yeah, less than before, but that's still the case. And Russia's budget seems to be getting more money from the EU than from the hard-working Russians trying to make it through the western borders in their Hyundai Solaris rides. But is it really all smooth sailing for Russia? On one hand, it'd be foolish to ignore the fact that the predictions of Russia's downfall haven't exactly come true, mostly because they keep the oil flow now going to India and China. On the flip side, Russia is unlikely to make the same profits out of oil and gas as they did in 2022. There's already restructuring of the logistics processes going and the big players have now adapted. At the same time, Russia is getting too comfortable and dependent on its relationship with two largest players, especially in the gas sphere, which only tightens their bond with the Eastern Dragon of China. In the big picture, the game is like one big tightrope walk. You should find that sweet spot and try not to fall. The West's been trying to cut all ties with the Russian fuel pipeline, but it's only working to some extent. Russia's seeking its ways to sell hydrocarbons to India and China, offering discounts when needed. At the end of the day, it all boils down to who can adjust better to the new conditions, or when these conditions become equally unbearable for everyone involved, so that they'll start looking for fresh ways to get things back to normal. The Russians got their answer a long time ago. Just hang tight. You know who to share this video with. We say special thanks to our supporters from Patreon. And I'm The Researcher. Thank you.